Why are we here? We're here to look at play scenarios, get better, refine our understanding of the rules, National Federation of High School Basketball Rules. When are we going to do that? We're going to do it right now. Stick around. Greetings. Welcome back to the Basketball Rules Expert. We look at play scenarios so we can refine our understanding of National Federation of High School Basketball Rules. When shall we start? Let's start right now. A1 is outside the three-point arc and throws a pass towards a cutting A2 in the lane area. The ball deflects off of the defender B2's head, bounces in the air, and then goes in the basket. The officials rule this to be a three-point goal and rule it a legal play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no, right? So we've had this play scenario previously. We've had it on Five Play Friday. We're going to review it today and some other variables, some various variations off of the play, right? So in this situation, a pass was thrown from behind the three-point arc. It hits a defender. Hold on one second. Hits a defender, uh, either their head, their arm, etc., bounces high into the air and passes through the goal. The officials rule this to be a three-point goal. This is the correct ruling on this play. National Federation says, National Federation of High School says, any thrown ball, thrown, passed, specifically recognizing that it can be a pass or shot from behind the three-point arc that contacts a defender within or with outside the three-point arc shall be counted as a three-point goal. So in this, in this instance, where the officials ruled a three-point goal in this instance, were they correct? Yes. Yes, they were. This is a three-point goal by rule. This brings up all sorts of questions as it applies. Well, wait a minute, right? It's a head scratcher, right? This was not a try for goal, and yet it passed through the basket. This is the correct ruling in this instance. And we're going to have a couple of variations off that on subsequent plays. But this play was correctly adjudicated by our crew. So in this instance, the officials got it right, but let's look at some variations on this scenario. A1 is outside the three-point arc and throws a pass towards a cutting A2 in the lane area. The ball deflects off of defender B2's head, caroms off the ring and into the backcourt where A3 recovers the ball. The officials rule this to be a legal play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Hmm. Sounds very similar to our previous play scenario. Ball is thrown. A defender either bats the ball or in this instance it hits off of their head. That's got to hurt, man. If it had enough force to hit their head, carry them off of the ring and into the backcourt, right? And at back, this is ruled to be a legal play. Hmm. Is this a legal play? We had team control in the front court. I missed, I should have added something to this play. We had team control in the front court. Who was the last to contact the basketball before it went into the backcourt? The opponent. It caromed off of their head, hit the ring, bounced into the backcourt, and the team recovered the ball. Had this uh, instead, um, let's say, caromed off the head, the ring, and a player from the throwing from the offense tipped the ball, and then it went into the backcourt, they would have been the last to touch. Our correct ruling in this scenario is the officials were correct. Even though this was not a try for goal, the opponent was the last to touch in the front court. If a teammate, if Team A had touched the ball in the front court in this situation, 
it would have been a backcourt violation. But in this instance, were the officials correct? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, they were. This would not be a backcourt violation by rule. We could easily see a scenario where we could have a backcourt violation because in a situation where the ball contacts the ring, usually it's because there is a try. And if we have a try, there's no team control by rule. But in this instance, even though if the ball had passed through the goal, it would have counted as three, it is not a try by rule. All right, two variations on the play. Let's take a look at another one. With only seconds remaining, A1 is outside the three-point arc and throws a pass towards a cutting A2 in the lane area. The ball deflects off of defender B2's outstretched arm high into the air and then goes through the basket just after the horn sounds. The officials rule this to be a successful three-point goal. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Wow. Horn sounds while the ball is in air in the air and then it passes through the goal. The officials, knowing that any thrown ball from behind the three-point uh, line that contacts the defender within the three-point line, is to be ruled a three-point goal if the ball passes through the basket. But this gets to the nub of the situation. Even though it would, if it passes through the basket, count as three points, was this a try for goal? When does the ball become dead in this situation? We know that when a try is in flight, the ball does not become dead when the horn sounds. But if this is not a try, then the ball would become dead when the horn sounds. So in this situation, were the officials correct? Yes or no? This is a good one. This is my interpretation on this play. In my interpretation, were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. Since this was not a try for goal, the ball became dead when it was in flight, just as a pass to a teammate would become dead with, when the ball is in flight, when the horn sounds. If this was a try, then we, the ball would not become dead. But in by rule in this situation, it is not a try, even though if during the ball was still live and the clock was still running, it would count as three goal, three points. So that's sort of the takeaway in this situation. The shoehorning of putting three points for the situation of deflection that goes in, that's prescribed by case play for National Federation of High School Basketball Rules. But we still can make judgments about whether this was a try or not. In ruling a successful three-point goal, our officials were not correct. Hey, we've got a tremendous group of show supporters. Let's see who is up on the show supporter big board today. Dakota Ted, Jeff Crawford, David Peterson, Robert Adams, and Maureen Mooney. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? There'll always be a link down in the show notes below. And yep, I'm going to put one up above. All right. So we finished with the deflected ball that goes in the basket plays, whether it's a try or not. Let's move on to another play scenario. Team A has the ball in the front court. A2 and A3 set a screen near the sideline. A1 runs out of bounds around the screening players and receives a pass from the other side. The officials rule a player technical foul on A1. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? This sounds really, really familiar. I know there's a situation where a player runs around screening players, re-enters the court, receives the ball, and that's a player technical, but that's during a throw-in. This was not that situation. So what we have here 
is a situation where we have live ball, teammate of the uh, offensive player leaves the court, goes around a screen, and re-enters the court. Our officials ruled this a player technical foul. Were the officials correct in this instance? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. This is an out-of-bounds violation on our player who left the court and then returned to the court. Simply an out-of-bounds violation in this situation. That would be the correct ruling. We do have a play scenario where during a throw-in, a player releases throw-in pass, fails to return to the court immediately, goes to a more advantageous position around two screeners, re-enters the court at that point. During that throw-in scenario, that is a player technical foul. In this scenario, it is not. All right, an unauthorized leaving of the court, out of bounds violation by a rule. What's up in our next scenario? Let's take a look. Team members A11 and A12 are standing in the bench area during play despite a previous warning by the game officials that they remain seated. The officials assess bench technical fouls on both team members and two indirect fouls on to the head coach. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Hmm. Well, players are and team members are responsible for their behavior. The team had been warned that players must remain seated. These two did not get the message. Therefore, the officials say these two players are both going to receive tactical fouls. Did our officials handle this play correctly? Right? So uh, in this situation, we had two tactical fouls on each of the team members and two indirects as a result on the head coach. Were the officials correct in this instance, yes or no? No. No, they were not. NFHS says when there are similar actions by team members, bench personnel, such as multiple players in this instance standing after, uh, the correct assessment would be one technical foul, one bench technical foul to the team, and therefore one indirect technical foul to the head coach. They are responsible for the behavior of bench personnel. So in this situation, if we had five players who were standing, it would be a single bench technical foul and an indirect, therefore, on the head coach. That would be the correct ruling in this scenario. A1 is at the free throw line for the first of a one and one While performing her habitual dribbles prior to the release, she accidentally allows the ball to deflect off of her foot and into the lane where it rolls into the leg of B3 in a marked lane space. The officials sound a whistle and rule a free throw violation on A1. Play will resume with an AP throw in on the end line. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Hmm. We've had this play before on Basketball Rules Expert, and I think, I think I may have <laughs> made an erroneous ruling, right? So in this situation, we are the first of one and one, right? And something happens, and we ultimately end up going to the possession error. Would that be the correct ruling in this situation? We are the first of one and one. Player has the ball at their disposal, dribbles it off of her foot, and it rolls away. The officials rule a violation, and since there was a violation on the first of a one-on-one, one, they go to the possession arrow for the resulting throw-in. Were, in this instance, are the officials correct, yes or no? No. No, they were not. This is a free-throw violation by A1. 
what is the result of a violation on the first of one and one would be a throw in to the opponent on the division line. That would be the correct ruling here. But it is, in the end, a free throw violation by the shooter. Our officials got that part correct, but the resulting throw in was incorrectly executed. Prior to A1's two free throws following a tactical foul, the Team B coach tells their five players to stand directly behind the thrower and behind the three-point line. The officials instruct the players to move back to the division line for the free throws. Were the officials correct in this instance? Yes or no? Well, everybody knows you have to go back to the division line for technical foul free throws. I don't know why this is a question because everybody knows that that's the case. Many officials know that to be the case, but of course, were is that the correct ruling in this situation? What are the restrictions on non on players who are not in marked lane spaces? In this instance, the officials instructed our players to move back to the division line where everybody knows they should go. Were they correct? Yes or no? No, 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 right? If we understand free throws, right? We understand the restrictions and where, uh, who is allowed in marked lane spaces and players who are not in marked lane spaces have restrictions. What are those restrictions? above the free throw line extended and the three point arc. Players who are in that place are legal by rule. When we have a technical foul free throw and there are no players in marked lane spaces, then all of the players besides the shooter are legal if they are behind the three point, the uh, free throw line extended and the three point arc semicircle, right? It's really straightforward. This is a common practice from far off long ago days that has become uh, incorporated into officials' understanding. But of course, in this instance, those players may stand legally behind the free throw shooter. And it's as simple as that. A1 is shooting the first of a one-and-one bonus. A4 and A5 are positioned in the first two marked lane spaces near the end line. And B4 and B5 are positioned in the second marked lane spaces. The incorrect alignment is recognized by the officials just after the successful try goes through the basket. The officials rule a simultaneous violation and disallow the goal. Play will resume with an AP throw-in on the end line. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Well, this would be a fine how do you do if it happened in your game, right? We're all, as officials, we're all subject to taking a little me time, as we like to say, in free throw situations. We go through the motions, everything is very practiced, etc., but we may disconnect from the game. And in this situation, we've allowed an illegal configuration with players in marked lane spaces. Of course, the opponents of the thrower must occupy the first two lane spaces, and teammates of the thrower may occupy the second two lane spaces. But in this situation, the officials did not allow that to happen or did not recognize that it had happened until the ball had successfully passed through the goal. And at that point, they recognized the illegal configuration. And did they properly then say, wait a minute, that's a throw, free throw violation? Were they correct in this instance? Yes or no? No, no, they were not. It is an illegal configuration, but in order to properly correct it, it must be recognized within the interval where we are allowed to assess that penalty. When does a free throw end by rule? 
when the throwing team violates, when the ball passes through the goal, or when it is clear that the free throw attempt will not be successful. Those are the three ways in which a free throw ends. In this instance, had the free throw ended. That's the key component in understanding about whether or not we can assess a violation. Once the free throw uh, has ended, we cannot um, assess a violation. So even though in this instance, the officials should have recognized the violation. Um, at, at this point, it was too late to correct, and our officials got this one incorrect. A1 is at the free throw line to attempt a final free throw. Just prior to release, the ball slips in A1's hands slightly, and they stop their attempt. B3 in a marked lane space steps into the lane. The officials rule a delayed lane violation on B3. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Right? So this seems really unfair, right? Our thrower is at the line, right? The Everybody in marked lane spaces is anxious to get to the rebound as quickly as possible. Uh, You know, opponents of the thrower are going to be boxing out, trying to gain inside position. Everybody's like at starters, uh, 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 the start of a race. You know, everybody's poised, ready, ready, ready. And the slightest uh, change in timing by our thrower here caused the defender to enter early. The officials ruled a delayed violation on this play. Is that the correct ruling in this situation? Is this the correct ruling on this play, yes or no? Yes. Yes, it is. As unfair as it may seem, right, if it was an involuntary action by the thrower, our opponents of the thrower are held to the standard that they must not violate in this situation until the ball is released by the thrower. A scenario that seems uh, wildly unfair to our opponents of the thrower, but in this instance, the officials made the correct ruling. During a throw-in by A1 from the end line by uh, by Team A's basket, the throw-in is touched by B2 before it goes across the division line where it was recovered by A3. The officials rule a backcourt violation on Team A. Were the officials correct in this instance? Yes or no? It's under the basket. A1 is our thrower. They release a throw-in pass near the division line. A2 deflects the ball and it goes into the backcourt. Right? A super common play. Teammate A3 collects the ball in the backcourt. Obviously, obviously in this instance, Team A was the last to touch in the front court and the first to touch in the backcourt. And we know that by rule, a team is awarded team control during a throw-in. So in this instance, where the officials ruled a backcourt violation, which is very logical in this instance, were our officials correct? No. No, they're not. They're not correct, right? This is a not an uncommon situation. Simple and straightforward. In order to have a backcourt violation, by rule, we must have team control. We do, right? It, no. The team control during a throw-in is only for the administration of fouls. In order to have a backcourt violation, we must have team control on the court, which is established by player control on the court. Player control on the court would be established by a player holding or dribbling the basketball. So the deflection by A2 near the division line does not establish team control on the court, Not until subsequently A3 grabbed it in the backcourt did we have that. So in this instance where the officials ruled a violation, were our officials? No, no. Got this one wrong. 
to wrap up this episode of Basketball Rules Expert. Hey, if this is the video content you find valuable, be a great time to do all of the things. Hit the like, the subscribe, and the notify so that you don't miss out on any of our new content. We have a tremendous group of show supporters who help fuel our broadcast, and we would like to shout them out right now. Dakota Ted, Jeff Crawford, David Peterson, Robert Adams, and Maureen Mooney. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? There will be a link down in the show notes below, and I'll put one up above. Awesome. We have additional video content available for you here. Here is our most recent basketball rules expert. Here's a playlist on backcourt rules and National Federation of High School. Make your choice. Choose wisely. We'll see you in the next one. Take care, everybody.